بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته uh, hello and uh, welcome to today's uh, webinar which will focus on uh, an important topic nowadays uh, in the context of uh, trustees practical work uh, the subject for today uh, for today's workshop will be best practice of uh, sales processes uh, first of all i'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for attending today's webinar and I would like to uh, express my sincere thanks to King and uh, Spalding for uh, organizing this uh, event today. Uh, actually, this uh, webinar today is one of the efforts that have been made by Bankruptcy Committee in order to advance the confidence in the bankruptcy uh, procedures. And uh, it is one of the events that have been uh, developed for continuous learning to improve the application of bankruptcy law and uh, the capabilities of, uh, 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 sorry, let me, yeah, uh, actually this, uh, this uh, workshop is, is one of the efforts that have been made to uh, advance uh, the confidence in the bankruptcy procedures. And it is one of the events that have been developed for uh, continuous learning to improve the application of bankruptcy law and the uh, capabilities of uh, professionals in the field of bankruptcy, including uh, uh, trustees and experts. Uh, we are honored to have uh, Mr. Michael Rainey and uh, Mr. Zaid Al-Farsi and Mr. Simon uh, Rahimzada and Mr. Jonathan Jordan, uh, our speakers today from uh, King and Spalding. Uh, I, I'd like to, to pass the mic to them now, but uh, before that, I'd like to, to give a few announcements. Uh, in Arabic, uh, first of all, للترجمة uh, العربية uh, for Arabic translation, you can تستطيعون الاستخدام زر interpretation اللي هو على شكل الكرة الأرضية في الزاوية أسفل العرض واختيار اللغة الألمانية German وستظهر لكم الترجمة باللغة العربية بمشيئة الله هناك أيضا رابط سيرسل لكم على المحادثة يتضمن العرض باللغة العربية البرزنتيشن باللغة العربية بمشيئة الله أيضا أود التأكيد على يعني مشاركتكم بالأسئلة ويعني الاستفسارات على Q&A في الشريط أدنى أيضا لا أريد أن نطيل عليكم I will pass the mic now to Mr. Michael uh, Hello Mr. Michael and uh, thank you so much for, uh, for being with us today Thank you Abdullah for that kind introduction and uh, yeah, we wish to thank the Bankruptcy Committee for inviting us to speak um, and as you've mentioned, Abdullah, the support um, that the committee has shown in, pro in promoting the bankruptcy law and ensuring that it works for all interested parties and you know, arranging sessions like this um, uh, you know, is just one example of how the committee is you know, supporting, the, um, support, supporting the new law and supporting those who, who are working um, in connection with the new law. My name is Mike Rainey and I'm a partner or banking and finance partner at King and & Spalding. And just a very brief int introduction to King & Spalding. We're an international law firm, 130 years old with 24 offices spread across the globe. Um, so we've got offices in the US, Asia, Europe and the Middle East. Um, we have a full service offering here in the Middle East, working out of offices in Dubai, Abu Dhabi and Riyadh in association with the law offices of Muhammad al -Amar. Personally, or for myself, my practice, I work with borrowers and lenders across the region, including in the UAE and Saudi Arabia, assisting them with their financing requirements. And since the introduction of the new insolvency law um, in Saudi, and you know, Saudi is, is one jurisdiction in the GCC that's recently enacted um, insolvency laws, another is the UAE, uh, more recently Kuwait, uh, Bahrain, Oman. Um, so I, together with others at the firm, have been you know, closely watching the law as it, as it was enacted. And um, you know, now that it's, it's been practically applied, uh, we're busy with both creditors and debtors um, who are navigating their way through the new procedures in the law. I would mention one thing, and I think some of this is down to what the committee has done. Um, that is the, the bankruptcy laws in Saudi are being used um, and now when you compare that to other jurisdictions, I know obviously Saudi 
is the is the largest um, country in the GCC. But if we compare it to, for example, the UAE um, and other jurisdictions, let's just benchmark it to the UAE, where the law has been, you know, ha hasn't been used as much, um, if at all. So, just comparing the two the two jurisdictions, it's great to see that um, not only the law has been enacted, but it's actually being used. Now, I'm joined today by three colleagues, and they will they will briefly introduce themselves. So, starting with Zaid. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Zaid Al Farisi. Like um, Mike, I'm also a banking and finance partner at King and Spalding. I focus on uh, financings and restructurings, specifically in Saudi Arabia, and I uh, began my practice there in the um, in the mid '90s. Thanks, Aid and Simon. Yeah, thank you so much, Mike. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Simon Rahim Zadar. I am a corporate partner at King of Sporting, unlike uh, Zaid and Mike, uh, based in Dubai, uh, specializing on cross-border mergers and acquisitions and private equity transactions across the Middle East. Uh, the nature of our work um, involves kind of a considerable number of different types of uh, transactions. In recent years, we've seen a slight increase in transaction activity advising buyers and sellers in connection with distressed assets or in distressed, uh, in distressed situations. Thanks, Simon. And John. Good afternoon. I'm honored to be here. My name is John Jordan, and I work in King and Spalding's Atlanta, Georgia office. I've been practicing bankruptcy law for nearly 30 years on all sides of the insolvency equation. I've worked for secured and unsecured creditors debtors, buyers, trustees, parties to litigation, and other interested parties from time to time. About a year and a half ago, Mike Rainey called me up to talk about the KSA bankruptcy law that was still being implemented at the time. We talked about the similarities between U.S. and Saudi bankruptcy laws and ways that some of the practices in the United States and the strategies that we've developed over the years might translate over to distressed companies and their creditors in the kingdom. Of course, not everything that works in the United States will translate well to the KSA law or to the business and legal environment of Saudi Arabia. But we hope to present you with some ideas that you might consider. And if you have the right circumstances and the right judge, perhaps some of these strategies will benefit your estates or clients. Yeah, no, that's great, John. And I think that's an important point for us to note that, um, you know, particularly Zaid and I, we do a lot of we do a lot of work in Saudi Arabia. And I know that, you know, there's been a, a large number of laws that have been passed um, in the last two to three years, um, obviously the bankruptcy law, but also laws in connection with the taking and perfecting of security. And, you know, all of these laws, um, you know, the kingdom's going to have to adapt to them and they will be implemented in a way that works for the kingdom. So while, you know, outside experience can help um, and provide some guidance and provide some ideas, ultimately, you know, the way these laws will work and be implemented will, you know, will, will um, over time, you know, will reflect Saudi Arabia, not the US or the UK. Um, all we can do is say, well, you know, in the UK, which is, I'm actually English qualified, we can say, yeah, we've got insolvency laws. Um, this is how, you know, we do things in the UK. Some of it, you know, as John said, may translate to Saudi, some of it may not. Um, but I think the, the, you know, the important thing for us, and Abdullah mentioned this at the beginning, is, you know, this is about discussing ideas. It's all of this legislation is new for everyone. Um, and bringing, you know, ideas from outside and saying this is how it should be done. I don't think that's going to work either. So it's kind of a combination of all of these things that we think that will, that will make the law of success. So out the title of our presentation, as we've said, is sales processes, best practice. And we've divided up the presentation into broadly three sections. We want to briefly touch on the what the law and the regulations say. So we've got the bankruptcy laws, we've got um, various guidance and regulations which have been issued. What do they say about 
selling assets in, in a bankruptcy situation. So we'll talk about that. Second, which is what we'll spend most time on, is looking at the sales processes themselves and you know, with the underlying goal of, of, of or the aim of maximizing value. That's, that's what the aim of the sales process is, is there to do. And thirdly, again, quite briefly, we just want to talk a little bit about the duties of the bankruptcy trustees generally and, you know, how, they, um, how those duties might be relevant to when assets are being sold. So the bulk of what we're going to be talking about is the sale processes themselves, but we'll book in that with a, a, a little bit um, of a discussion in, in relation to the law itself. So that's what we look like in real life, just in case you're wondering. Um, we are real humans, even though we're all, we're all getting used to speaking through computers. So starting with the law, um, and I think it's always helpful to start with the law because you know, we, you know, you can come up with some broad, you know, broad ideas about as to the way you go about selling assets. But as a minimum, I think we need to, we need to understand what the law says. Um, and I think our starting place is um, Article 5. So Article 5, the aim of the bankruptcy law includes maximizing the value of bankruptcy assets upon a liquidation. Just note the word maximizing the value. So John, maybe I can just I'm just going to pose a question to you and just to get your, we, I mean, just so you know, as we go through this presentation, I'm just going to sort of pose some questions to my colleagues um, with the idea that we have a discussion and hopefully that discussion helps you. Now, we're also happy to take questions. I believe they'll be, they'll be taken at the end. Um, but the way we're going to run this presentation is we're going to have a discussion amongst ourselves and hopefully that's beneficial to you. So, John, you know, why might that article um, help us in providing some guidance on the procedures for selling assets? Well, Mike, Article 5, of course, uh, presents the overall policy goals, the aims of the bankruptcy law. And as you said, uh, Article 5, subsection C, discusses maximizing the value of the bankruptcy assets it also says that uh, we should ensure a controlled sale of the assets and a fair distribution of the proceeds. Now, the concept of maximizing asset value appears in other places in the law. Article 104 refers to obtaining the best possible price in a liquidation sale. Article 108, subsection C, talks about how in a liquidation, the trustee may convene a meeting to deliberate on deferring the sale of an asset for a reasonable period if that is in the best interests of creditors. There are other provisions such as Article 184, uh, 186 that talks about using financing to help leverage the sale proceeds and Article 200 prohibits selling the asset below market price. The, a lot of these provisions talk about price, but it's important to remember that obtaining the best outcome for the estate, maximizing the value of the bankruptcy assets, in the, the words of, the, uh, of Article 5, is not necessarily the same thing as obtaining the highest price uh, at the particular time of sale. Uh, you have to consider many things that are natural to merger and acquisition lawyers and businessmen such as how much money should we spend advertising the assets to bring the highest sale? Should we hire an investment bank or some other specialist to assist with the disposition of assets? And how long should the, should the assets be marketed? And how long can the debtor afford to hold the assets out to the market for testing to see what the best price is before the debtor runs out of money? If these considerations lead to the conclusion that the estate needs to spend some money in order to maximize the value of the assets, then I think the law permits that. And it's up to trustees with, uh, of course, the, the input of the court primarily, as well as other creditors to balance things like advertising money or an investment bank or the amount of runway the debtor has to hold an asset out against the price that will be realized. Yeah, no, so that so that that's that's helpful, John, because I think the point we're trying to make here 
is that um, it's also going to obviously depend on the asset that is being sold. Um, and we'll, that sort of leads into in what, in, you know, in what procedure are assets being sold. So when we look at the, um, at the law, we have you know, the, the two procedures that we're, we're seeing um, most often um, used are the financial reorganization proceedings and liquidation. So in a financial reorganization proceeding, um, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more um, detail, uh, when we come to the come to the sales processes, but the FRP generally is is not a procedure in which you know assets are being sold. Um, we're going to debate that a little bit um, as we when we get to the next couple of slides. But the, the basic idea is that the entity that enters the process um, exits the process as a going concern. The, 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 this idea that the that a debtor would enter a process and a good part of the business would be sold, with the bad part of the business being left behind and liquidated, you know, we don't think that the FRP procedure um, contemplates that. So, but there are one or two um, provisions within the FRP chapter which does you know it, which does refer to. Um, disposals. And of course, a proposal that's voted on and ratified by the creditors as part of that, um, you know, could part of that could include the disposal of non-core assets. And of course, the bankruptcy trustee you know, may be involved in that process as well. So when we talk about best practices for selling assets, yes, mainly it's going to be in a liquidation context, but there may be circumstances in the FRP where um, assets are being sold as well. So what we're talking about um, may be relevant to, to sales in that process. And of course, the other thing to bear in mind, it's not really relevant to this topic, but of course, um, you know, we do see um, assets being disposed of by distressed companies outside of a procedure. So uh, Simon will talk a little bit about that, but we've, you know, we've been dealing, um, we've had clients who, who both sold and bought um, assets that have, that have been disposed of by a distressed company um, outside, of, a, outside of, of an FRP and a liquidation. Then turning to liquidation, um, again, you know, there's very, various articles that, you know, reference the, um, the sales process and the, you know, when we're looking at the bankruptcy legislation, it's the chapter on liquidation, which really contemplates the disposal of assets. So this is where the bankruptcy trustee um, takes control of the business. Uh, so debtor is no longer um, in control, unlike FRP, where the debtor remains in control during the procedure under the supervision of a bankruptcy trustee in a liquidation, um, the bankruptcy trustee uh, will um, take over management of the business and is responsible for selling the assets. So one thing to consider and one thing we will discuss is, you know, if you, if you do have a business um, which, you know, is, there's a good part to it, but we, we, it's not possible to get the creditors to agree on a solution. Um, you know, could the liquidation process be used to dispose of a business? I think most of us think that when we get to liquidation, we're just thinking about the disposal of um, hard assets. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, if you've got a construction company and it goes into liquidation, you're thinking about maybe you're thinking about the plant and equipment that the business has and you're selling that, you're not necessarily thinking about um, uh, selling part of the business, which may still be profitable. So we'll, 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 um, we will talk a little bit about that and, and just whether liquidation, whether it's possible to sell a business as opposed to just assets out of liquidation. <laughs> 
And just to finish up, um, so we've, we've mentioned Article 5, we've um, mentioned, you know, where in the law, you know, the, the different articles where um, selling of assets is, is referenced. But Zaid, maybe you also just want to briefly mention Chapter 8 of the rules um, organising with work of bankruptcy trustees and experts, just whether there's anything else in there we need to keep an eye on. Sure, Mike, happy to do that. So um, Chapter 8 um, of, the, um, uh, of, of these rules provide kind of further detail and, and considerations, procedures in connection with, with the sale of assets. So there are provisions, for example, Article 29 um, in relation to um, a pre-sale, so prior to the sale of the assets. Um, and these include uh, an obligation on the office holder to ensure that, I mean, some of this is, is sort of elementary, but the office, the office holder should ensure that, you know, the, the, there's a final judgment for the, uh, for the liquidation has been obtained. Um, to the extent any specific assets are subject to a dispute, the court's consent must be provided. And this particular point is going to come up later on from another perspective, which is, you know, how does a buyer of assets ensure that the assets they're purchasing are not problematic? So indirectly, you have some, pr some protection here. And then there, there are other provisions that connect with, with um, uh, articles from the bankruptcy law, you know, the context where announcements need to be made prior to the sale of certain assets. Those obviously need to be observed. If any voting is required, for example, in the context of a sale of uh, an asset that's um, the value of which is 25% or more of the um, bankruptcy um, uh, assets. You need, you, you need obviously to, to have a, a vote of the uh, creditors and then uh, opening an, uh, an account um, uh, prior to the sale. And then I'll mention maybe one or two other things very briefly. Um, one particularly interesting article, and this really goes to, to, to the heart of this, it relates to considerations in connection with the, um, with the actual sale. So we've mentioned that Article 104, John had mentioned, refers to selling at the best price possible. And this particular article fleshes it out a little bit more and, and refers to the, um, to the office holder um, effecting the sale at the best possible price, taking into consideration relevant factors, including, and I'll just mention two that are very interesting. Um, and, and really, as you can see there, as you will see in, in, in considering this, there's going to be a, a balancing act that needs to take place. So one is a reasonable time period for the, for the sale to be effective, consistent with the duration of the liquidation procedure and kind of the swift distribution of proceeds among creditors. So you can obviously see there, there's some competing uh, interests there. Those need to be balanced. And the second key one is the timing of the sale and, and how that impacts the potential price of the asset. And this also connects back with a point John had mentioned earlier under Article 108.1c, where um, uh, the office holder should obtain the, um, the uh, uh, approval or, or a vote of, um, of uh, creditors uh, if they're looking to defer the sale of a particular asset. Yeah, thanks, Aid. So look, that's just a, a high level summary. And I think that the takeaway is that you know, the law and the regulations and the guidance do say something about the sales process. So, you, we, you know, we can't just be selling assets in the vacuum. We need to be thinking about it against the backdrop of the legislation. So that's, that's the takeaway. Um, not that we want to, you know, educate you on every single article uh, in the law um, or every um, article in the regulations. It's more that you know, the law does say something about the sales process, how it should be conducted, the considerations that you need to take into account. Um, so good to be aware of that. Turning now to the sales processes, and this is the more practical side of the presentation. Um, and we will, you know, our starting point again is, you know, when you're, when you're selling assets, it is the, um, you know, maximizing the value of, of the bankruptcy assets. And so that's our starting point. But before we delve into this, I, I thought, and this flows on from the previous slides, I just wanted to, Zaid and John, just ask you, you know, a couple of questions. Um, so we start with, 
So, so before we start discussing the sale of assets um, in a bankruptcy, can we just spend a few moments discussing in what circumstances assets can be sold in an FRP? Um, so that's the, in a financial reorganization proceeding. We, I think we all comfortable, we know about liquidation, um, bankruptcy trustee takes over, um, sells the assets, and we will, we will talk about that. But in the context of an FRP, um, Zaid and, and John, we, we discussed this at length. Um, and I think, you know, based on our reading of the law and also some practical experience, you know, the sale of a good part of a business out of FRP, leaving behind the bad part to be liquidated, um, does not appear to be contemplated by the by the FRP. So, Zaid, I mean, maybe you can just discuss that in a little bit more detail and, and just why we've reached that conclusion. And John, again, I think it would be helpful if you just um, shared your experience on Chapter 11 and, you know, which Chapter 11 has some similarities to FRP. Um, and the, the similarities are that the, 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 the debtor remains in control of the business, but under the supervision of a trustee. Um, and there is a moratorium during which time the debtor has a period of time to get its house in order. But how the debtor exits FRP and how the debtor exits Chapter 11 are quite different. And I think it's worthwhile just talking about that a little bit um, and making sure we're all on the same page there uh, before we start talking about sales processes themselves. So Zaid, maybe just starting with you, you can just expand a little bit on what you, you John and I have discussed and then John can just chip in on chapter 11. Happy to do so, um, Mike. I, mean, I think the way the law is set up, um, the way the, the, the procedures are, um, uh, are, are structured, based obviously on, on public policy uh, considerations and choices. Um, I, I think it's, it's pretty clear, and also the way this is being applied by the courts, I think it's pretty clear. And you'll see, you know, we've talked about specific provisions in the law referring to uh, sales in the context of an FRP, very limited. There's Article 82 where it's a sale of a secured asset for a specific purpose, obviously compensating a secured creditor. And then beyond that, it's sort of more in passing, right? So there's the, um, the instances where a company may choose to, and the term that's used, you know, transfer uh, uh, assets, and you obviously need the approval of the, um, of the office holder in that context to ensure that, you know, everything's done fairly properly. Um, so, so those are the provisions in the law. Um, more generally, and going back to Article 5, they're the aims of the law. And the way, the way I would think about it simplistically is an FRP, in an FRP procedure, the law is, is aiming to help the company get back on its feet and come out of that process. Um, maybe not necessarily intact, it could shed a, you know, a limb here on there or there, it could sell parts of the business, but certainly the, the, the business comes out and continues to exist. And as soon as you're moving outside of that or beyond that, you're dealing with you're dealing with the liquidation, uh, and uh, again, you know, as reflected in the various provisions, the detailed provisions. I mean, whenever we're talking about detailed provisions relating to the sale of assets, including Chapter Eight that we just talked about it in these recently issued rules, it's all in the context of liquidation. So I think that's that, that's how I would think about these two. Yeah, and John, maybe yeah, so maybe just share a little bit of your experience because we'll come back to this. Um, as we go through the presentation, but we've just said that in an FRP, the typical exit is either the if the debtor can't agree a turnaround plan, it, there'll be a liquidation. Um, if it can agree a turnaround plan, then typically the, the debtor that enters the process exits the process as, as a going concern. Maybe just compare that a little bit to what happens in the States. Certainly, Mike. In the United States, the FRP, as you mentioned, is called Chapter 11. In a Chapter 11 or reorganization case, the classic reorganization and the way it originally was almost always done was that the debtor became a reorganized company in essentially its same form. The equity was typically transferred to the creditors or some other party but the debtor emerged 
in something of its, its, for, it, its original form. It might pare down some unprofitable lines of business or sell off some assets that were not, that it needed uh, for, for ca when it needed cash to pay for expenses of the secured creditors or others, but generally it reorganized. However, in the last 20 years, sales, even in the chapter 11 or reorganization context have become more popular. Reorganization bankruptcies are expensive and the longer they go on, the more assets are consumed by lawyer fees, accountant fees, and other expenses. Uh, we sometimes refer, refer to a bankruptcy estate as the melting ice cube. Sales can sometimes solve the problem because they can be accomplished in as little as 30 days, though the typical time frame is closer to 45 to 90 days, and that doesn't take into account whatever marketing of the particular asset or business is needed. But the sales can take some of the operational issues out of a bankruptcy case uh, so that what we're left with is just a pile of money that has to be distributed. Sometimes a lender will uh, want to keep the assets if it's a secured lender and it will bid on the, on the, the debtor company. We recently represented the investment firm of KKR in its acquisition of the Borden Dairy Company, where the secured lender ended up buying the company because it was comfortable with the asset package. Uh, we also represented a debtor that had a chemical manufacturing plant that it needed to sell. And we used the reorganization procedure to keep current management in, in place so that there was no loss of value of the assets. And that's sometimes a critical concern. Uh, we don't want a, a new person to come in who doesn't know how to run the business. Uh, and in some cases that can help. Uh, we used the sale process to navigate around the environmental and regulatory issues the company had to make it basically a merger and acquisition or in this case, a sale uh, outcome. So a sale process can make the bankruptcy easier in the United States, and we can do it through both a, the liquidation chapter, uh, which is a different chapter called chapter seven. And over here, we sometimes do it in the context of a reorganization. Uh, we call that a chapter 11 liquidation. <clears throat> Thanks, John. So I think that, again, the, you know, the point we make, we're not saying what happens in the States should happen in Saudi. It's just an interesting um, comparison. Uh, and obviously, as Zaid alluded to, you know, there'll be some policy reasons behind that. Um, so, but, so when we, you know, I think when we're talking about sales processes, we, you know, we really are going to be talking about the liquidation rather than the, rather than the FRP. So when contemplating the sale of bankruptcy assets, um, you know, in, in simple terms, and sorry, just before I start, I, I am getting the question. So Osama, I've got a question and Osama, I've got your question. So we will answer those as we as we go through these slides. Um, so please keep the questions coming and, we'll, we'll, coming and we'll, we'll look to answer them. But, you know, I guess we, you know, in very simple terms, when you're selling an S asset, um, you've got, you know, two choices. You, you, you say, you, you do a sale, through, through, a, through a private sale, a bilateral contract, or um, an auction. So Simon, I guess just talking practically here, if I, um, if I was a liquidator um, and um, you know, I'll, obviously I'll have some, some of my own ideas about the best way to dispose of an asset, but um, maybe you know, if I said to you, you know, what would your advice be um, and can you talk me through the, the pros and cons of a private sale versus an auction? Um, and when we talk about an auction, you know, you know, what is it that you would describe as an auction? What would that process be? Can I can I just get you to give a few thoughts on that? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Mike. Um, look, I, well, so I think ultimately what it comes down to is ensuring that um, as a liquidator or as a seller, you um, achieve uh, the best value for the relevant asset. And um, how is that achieved? Well, um, I guess that's achieved by ensuring that the asset has been appropriately marketed to a sufficient number of potential buyers that are most capable 
um, to accept what ultimately becomes underlying limitations that a liquidator or a seller is under when disposing of um, those assets. For example, when you kind of drill down and it slightly gets a little bit legalistic, but in the transaction documents that you're all hopefully going to see at some point, um, there's lots of discussions about uh, warranties and indemnities and um, the extent to which um, a seller or the, or the entity controlling it can actually provide those um, types of protections to a particular buyer in respect of the assets. And often the best way um, for a liquidator, I guess a, a seller, uh, to get um, the best value is to open up the asset for consideration by multiple potential buyers through an auction process rather than a bilateral process. Um, now the auction process is different to the bilateral because it involves a number of different buyers, as I mentioned, um, and it also involves, a, importantly, a competitive process. And it's a competitive process both as to price, um, but also, uh, importantly, contractual terms. So the warranties and the indemnities and the extent of them would be um, competitively uh, tendered and therefore competitively received in terms of markups um, from potential buyers. Um, an auction process is run with uh, a financial advisor, just to give some background as to how that's actually done. Um, and those financial advisors are typically investment banks and other kind of um, similar institutions. Um, and given the nature of the process, um, it, an auction can be very closely monitored um, and controlled, uh, importantly from a timing perspective, because um, the uh, investment banks or the liquidator can actually control the timing for offers and also control the overall uh, timeline for closing the transaction. Whereas I guess with a, with a bilateral process, when you have just one bidder, that control over timing becomes a little bit more difficult because ultimately you're, you're as a seller or liquidator, you're, in the mer you're at the mercy of the buyer as one particular party um, as to how quickly that buyer can get internal approvals, how quickly that buyer can agree um, to the uh, risk allocation in the transaction documentation. Um, and I guess in terms of an auction process, you'd probably also as a, as a liquidator be able to speed up that process as well by um, typically undertaking uh, a financial and illegal due diligence uh, exercise yourself um, and uh, appointing advisors to prepare reports, which you could then give to bidders. Um, and, and why is that important? Well, you're gonna have multiple bidders uh, in the process, looking at contracts and looking at the underlying asset and the financial situation. So if you've got reports already available that you've spent say a couple of weeks while, or, or a few weeks while you were assessing the viability of the sale or the structure of the sale, then you would typically make those reports available uh, to all buyers. And um, you would also make available the transaction documents. So you put to get together a package as it were of the reports plus the transaction documents. And then you'd ask all the buyers to give you their, as I mentioned earlier, their competitive, I guess, um, markups to, for you to assess the, the contractual terms. And uh, those reports that I just mentioned would also be given to the final buyer on a reliance basis. So you'd be telling that final buyer that, hey, you don't need to be so concerned by um, uh, your own diligence exercise. The legal advisors or the, fi or the financial advisors that I appointed um, will allow you to rely on that report. Um, uh, so to the extent it's, it's incorrect, you have some recourse. Great, thank you, Simon. Um, th that's helpful. One of the questions we've received um, is under an auction, um, what does it mean to ensure a level playing field? And John, I'm going to um, get you to g give us um, some ideas on this because I know that in the context of um, business disposals that you've been involved in, um, some, of the, some of them are through an auction procedure 
the next slide talks about this a little bit, but we can we can I think we can talk about it um, now. Um, so, you know how uh, I mean the, for me the idea is that you know I if I'm buying an asset I want to be I want to ensure that I'm being treated as every like every other buyer, um, and that's what we mean by you know ensuring a level playing field, and you know we John yesterday we were just talking talking about what we were going to some of the ideas we were going to be talking about on this presentation, but maybe also just talk about the, um, we can roll it into it, but the stalking horse, the idea of, you know, having um, working through a, a sale agreement with a prospective purchaser who then knows that that um, purchase agreement is going to be shopped around other buyers to see if there can be a higher price and how you would, you know, convince someone to do that. Um, so maybe th th there are a couple of themes I think we'd like to explore. Sure, Mike. Um, as, as Simon mentioned, we're looking for the best outcome. Uh, and he talked about the auction process. Uh, buyers, as Mike indicated, have to have confidence that there is a level playing field, meaning that no one has an unfair advantage, that all parties, no, nobody has the high ground and, uh, and an unfair advantage in the marketing process. Now, courts and lawyers have developed processes in different jurisdictions to ensure that the bankruptcy sales are fair, and that, encourage, that fairness is what you need to encourage prospective buyers to come forward. One of the ways we encourage buyers to come forward, as Mike indicated, is to look for a stalking horse. Um, this is another, uh, another metaphor uh, we sometimes use over here. It, it is really a reference to the horse that you hide behind when you're going hunting so, uh, so that the deer doesn't see you before you shoot it. Uh, the stalking horse in this case is the person who, uh, is the company that's the first bidder. Uh, it's the initial bidder who does the initial due diligence that Simon talked about. Uh, that stalking horse bidder puts in the time and the money to negotiate a definitive purchase agreement uh, it, and it negotiates the form of the court order that will approve the sale. It does the due diligence. And that uh, stalking horse will oftentimes encourage other bidders to come forward because then the due diligence is done. It's often put in a room and so forth. Now, like any other uh, acquisition deal, being a stalking horse bidder costs a lot of money and it involves in a bankruptcy case a unique deal risk that the court ultimately will not approve the offer. Uh, sales are always subject to court approval in a bankruptcy case. So a stalking horse bidder sometimes wants protections in case the bankruptcy court approves somebody else's bid, which we'll talk about in a moment. So you have to get court approval in a bankruptcy case. And this is frequently done in a two-step process. Uh, the first step uh, after you get have a stalking horse bidder is to get the court to approve the procedures, the, the ground rules, the rules of the road for the auction. Uh, this way, all the parties know that here are the rules. We're not going to have any kind of, of side deal with one party to give them an advantage. It's part of the fairness uh, question. The court will, will approve uh, or may approve bidding procedures that include uh, provisions for non-disclosure agreements, a time for due diligence by the parties, deadlines for qualifying bids. So we have the stalking horse bidder and if anybody wants to bid, they have to get their bid in by a certain date that the court can set. Uh, the court can approve deposits for qualifying bids. Sometimes that's, it could be 5% of the purchase price, depending on the size of the asset. It may approve uh, requirements for qualifying bidders. They have to prove they have a certain net worth to show that they can close the transaction. Uh, the court can approve the rules for the auction process such as the amount, the, the amount of overbids that are required instead of letting everybody uh, bid just a, a small amount, the court may say, here are the increments in which successive bids have to be placed. 
Uh, the court can approve rules regarding whether backup bids are binding. So if you don't win the auction, if you come in second place, you can, uh, your, your bid is binding until we know whether the first bid is going to close or not. And as, as Mike indicated, it can sometimes include stalking horse protections. The uh, stalking horse bidder says, I put a lot of money and time into investigating this company. I negotiated an agreement that, we th that the debtor is going to shop around. So I want a fee in case somebody else outbids me. And uh, courts can approve different amounts. In the United States, it's somewhere around three or three and a half percent, depending on the judge. Uh, that might be a breakup bid, uh, a breakup uh, fee. If the uh, stalking horse bid is unsuccessful, sometimes the stalking horse bidder will instead ask for reimbursement of its legal expenses up to a certain point. Uh, and then finally, the court can make uh, advance rules for talking about things like assignments of contracts and periods to object to that. So the court approves that uh, those, those ground rules in advance. And then after the deadlines, after the, uh, the qualifying bids are submitted, the debtor may hold an auction. It can be in the uh, conference room of a law firm. It can even be in the court. It can be at any place that makes sense. And uh, after that auction, the debtor determines what the highest and best bid is. Uh, it announces a winner and sometimes a backup bidder. bidder. And then the parties go back to court for the second step, which is to get the court's final approval of a sale. And uh, while there are different variations of the auction process, and what I've outlined is probably the most elaborate and formal, these are ways that we ensure that uh, buyers are encouraged to come forward and can bid with confidence on the assets, knowing what they're getting. Yeah, thanks, John. So. Um private sale auction would, would you say that the stalking horse where you know we get a bidder who comes along puts in all the hard work agrees a price and then that um th then that um deal is then shopped around to other bidders would, was that a hybrid auction what how would you describe that um that process it, it it is a hybrid in the sense that the debtor shops things shops the deal around in advance um, and there are different ways to hold the what, I, what I've called an auction, but it doesn't have to be in the classic auction sense. Uh, if the debtor, of course, gets no other bids, then you go straight to court approval. If the yeah. debtor gets other bids, then it can either um, you know, negotiate or, or do shuttle diplomacy with the, with the buyers, or it can hold an actual auction. So they're, they're very different. There are many different ways that we can solve the business problem. And it's up to the lawyers, the debtor, and the courts to figure out what makes the most sense, again, as Article 5 says, to maximize the value of the assets. Yeah, and that's a good point. And I think, you know, I think with a, you know, a lot of our experience to date is that the, you know, the liquidations have been, you know, reasonably let's call it straightforward. Um, so, you know, we have some hard assets that need to be sold. I think where things, you know, become a little bit more interesting um, is where, you know, a, there is a business to be sold. Um, and with all of these um, sales processes, of course, someone has to pay for it. Um, now, if the shareholders or the equity are no longer in the picture, then, the the liquidator, of course, wants to be wants to be sure that um, you know the expenses of the liquidation are going to be covered from the sales proceeds. So I think as a you know as a starting point, um, you know, that's where you need to think. It's all very well having these elaborate auctions um, and you know entering into stalking horse arrangements, etc. But you know it's it's got to be um, appropriate for the, for the actual disposition that's taking place. So that's great. So um, then I had a, another question for Simon, and there is one more question we've got here, and, and around um, if if you if we've got a liquidation and the sale price at auction is less than the value of the asset, um, 
you know, what steps would the liquidator need to take? So we will answer that question in a minute. The just turning again to, to Simon, maybe we can just talk now a little bit about, um, you know, what's the difference between buying um, buying uh, assets in a distressed situation or out of a bankruptcy compared to, you know, buying it in a in a in a non-distressed situation. What are the what are the things that come up, and you know, are there any ways we can we can fill the gaps? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Michael. Um, I've, I've turned on my camera so most people can see me now. Um, well, a distressed asset often has the potential to have a lot more uh, known and uh, unknown liabilities than a than a non-distressed asset. For example, amounts owed to third-party creditors. Um, directly and also uh, consequential liabilities for uh, late penalties and the like. Um, so a distressed asset naturally could come with a lot more risk, uh, which a seller will want a um, purchaser to ultimately assume. And so there's obviously uh, uh, in the negotiations a lot of uh, back and forth as to who is most appropriate to kind of bear certain risks that you'll ultimately be trying to push to each other seller and the buyer under a transaction document. Um, so as such, a seller of a distressed asset will want to kind of avoid um, giving substantial undertakings or comforts to a buyer in respect to of the assets, given that there may be a vast number of ways that the seller could then um, uh, be sued after closing um, in connection with them to the extent that those undertakings uh, are breached and thereby the seller would then lose value uh, from the kind of purchase price or the consideration, which it, it will have spent a long time negotiating and having received uh, from a purchaser. So often a seller of a distressed asset will want a purchaser to acquire the asset on as close to as possible on what's called an as is, where is basis. So um, the seller or the liquidator will essentially be telling a buyer or trying to force a buyer to rely, I guess, more on the buyer's commercial, financial, and legal diligence of the particular target assets, rather than um, relying on those undertakings that I mentioned from the seller that, that the buyer could then uh, sue the seller for. I think from a buyer's perspective, there are also a lot more uh, considerations for the underlying sale and purchase agreement. For example, uh, it becomes more necessary to request holdbacks, retentions, and possibly even earnout arrangements. Um, in addition, a buyer may want to discuss very early on in the process uh, what's called warranty and indemnity insurance. Now, WNI insurance is extremely interesting because um, through WNI insurance, the parties could essentially push the risk of a lot of the unknown liabilities over to an insurance provider who is probably more likely in a better place to assume that risk given that it's um, assuming risks on unknown matters is part of its business model. Um, it would probably have back-to-back -back insurance arrangements for them um, and also will be in a better position to compensate a buyer for any breaches of those warranties and indemnities under the SPA. Um, warranty indemnity insurance is a fast growing product in the GCC and we tend to recommend it to a lot of our clients uh, if they're gonna look at warranty indemnity insurance um, in connection with transactions like this to start that process as early as possible. It does add a lot of value on a transaction, particularly in a distress type situation where um, tempers are, are, are probably flying and the seller obviously wants to get a deal done as fast as possible. Uh, there's, uh, there's creditor pressure. And so if you could um, get yourself into a position where you as a seller or, or even as a buyer you could uh, put together a policy uh, within an insurance company to cover those risks, then um, you're, uh, you're, you're doing yourself a lot of service, good service, and uh, hopefully getting a transaction closed faster than you would do um, if you didn't do it with, uh, with hopefully less risk and, and less claims as against um, either the, uh, the seller who itself might be distressed um, or, or, or any other third parties. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. So the, um, the other thing, obviously, to think about is, you know, how you get paid. I mean, I think cash is king. Um, but, 
you know, there may be, um, in particular, if a buyer cannot get comfortable with the due diligence because some of the due diligence might be limited, um, as Simon said, that you know, with you know, with typical disposals and liquidation, you're going to be buying as as whereas. So you will obviously, as a buyer, be looking to do as much due diligence as you can. Um, but uh, you know, if you can't, you get all the information that you need to get comfortable. You may say, well, um, look, I'm prepared to pay 50% now, and then you know, in 18 months' time, I'll pay the balance once you know I've, I've you know got control of this asset and can understand um, you know what the what the um, liabilities may be in connection with this asset. So don't always think that we need to be paid cash. There may be some maybe some other options. And I think the, you know, as a buyer of assets out of a distressed or a bankruptcy process, you know, one of the, the big issues, of course, is you want to be taking those assets free and clear of liens um, or encumbrances. So uh, Zaid, I might just start with you, but also um, um, John, if you've got any thoughts on, you know, how we go, how we go about that, how we give comfort to buyers that, um, that you know, they're buying free and clear of liens. I guess I'd say a couple of things, Mike. I mean, one, I'm not sure that there's a, a, a specific piece of legislation that can provide this comfort in this context. For example, um, a, a buyer of um, uh, uh, assets in, in the in the context of a liquidation. But I do think that there, there are other ways of getting comfort. Number one, the, um, the laws on taking security have uh, greatly evolved in, in the kingdom. So you have the commercial pledge law that was overhauled last year, the, the new law on um, taking security over um, movable assets, um, whereby um, the, the, the laws reach a stage where you know, there's this idea of what a secured creditor is and a, and a creditor that has a right in a specific asset and that right continuing to, to, to follow that asset wherever it's gone. Uh, which is to say that in the context of a liquidation, if a buyer can ascertain by searching, again, now these publicly uh, available registers by doing their homework on, on whether or not the particular asset is secured. And of course, if it's secured, then it gets its own treatment under the law. So, so long as, as that's not in place, in other words, there's, the, there's no perfected security interest, they ought to have protection. Uh, they ought to have protection by default under the law. I mean, I think that's probably the best, the best position that you can arrive at. And then I think the other thing is just looking at it contextually. To the extent there are any interest in this that haven't been um, that haven't been perfected, in other words, they're not enforceable against third parties. Uh, any creditor that would have an interest would be in this universe of the of the liquidation. So you know all of the relevant characters are there, and again, it's not perfect. You know, maybe in other jurisdiction there's there's protection that's express protection that's provided under the law, but I think indirectly you can take you can take comfort in this regard. Yeah. No, I think I think that's right. I mean, it, to some extent, it will be on a case by case basis. I guess if there's any uncertainty, you may get an order from the court. But as you say, if you're buying real estate and it's subject to the mortgage, subject to a mortgage, well, obviously that mortgage has got to be released. Um, and if you're buying um, assets that are subject to, um, you know, movable assets that are subject to security interests, then you would want those security interests removed as, as part of the as, as part of the acquisition of the assets. So typically, you know, you're going to need the cooperation of any secured lender who would be then releasing. Um, releasing the security and I guess if they weren't cooperating then you'd need to get the court involved uh, now yeah Mike uh, one that, that's a very good point and one way that we might try to approach that depending on the cooperation of the court where you do not have the consent of a creditor uh, we might take we also also could uh, look at article 75 subsection 4 it's a section on security interests and it provides that a proposal, Again, this is now this is in the context of an FRP uh, can request court permission to alter a security interest as long as the affected creditor receives a guarantee equivalent to its original interest. So stated another way, if you have the right judge, uh, you might try asking the court to uh, approve the sale of an asset that terminates the security interest or lien in that asset. 
and then gives the secured creditor an interest in the proceeds of that asset. It's, uh, it, it's unclear, but that also might be something that can be plugged in if you need to. Yeah, because I think you, where, we, where we run into the issue is if you've got an uncooperative secured creditor or the secured creditor just might not be around for whatever reason. I mean, typically they will because in most contexts, the, the um, secured creditors are going to be a bank. Um, we, we now know that you know, there are other providers of finance in the market, um, including finance companies, but also you know, including some, you know, some other some other entities that are providing financing. Um, so something something to bear in mind. Now, just to finish, um, and we'll just keep this brief, but I've just mentioned here anti-assignment clauses. So um, Zaid, maybe you just want to explain what, what, what that is about um, and the issues that we need to think about. And in particular, I think I'm thinking about, you know, if you're looking to sell a business um, which operates out of bespoke, um, a com a bespoke pr a premises. Um, you know, if you're going to sell that business, obviously you'd want to be, you, you'd want to ensure that it can still continue to operate out of that premises. Um, so how how we might go about doing that? Yeah. Uh, so so just to flesh out the the point Mike's made is is the extent to which, for example, a key uh, lease may contain a provision uh, prohibiting the, the assignment of that lease by the, by the tenant to anyone else. Uh, and as you can imagine in this context, then there would be some sort of a, a conflict between that contractual position um, and the reality that the tenant is, is, is bankrupt or, or um, uh, insolvent and, and needs to be replaced or, or effectively will be replaced if, um, um, if in the context of the sale of, um, of assets, a, a buyer is going to take over that, so that position. Um, and again, uh, I, I think this is still, uh, I'll be honest, it's a work in progress in how I'm thinking about it, but maybe I'll say a couple of thoughts. Um, so so that, that, that's the issue. The issue. Um, one idea is you know, whether or not that, that process that would happen, in other words, when a buyer is taking over this position, if that's really an assignment or maybe a succession of sorts, and whether there's room in that, um, the relevant agreement to allow for that, again, assuming, uh, assuming there's a prohibition on it. Um, the next level may be, again, the cooperation of that um, uh, landlord. And again, I'm sure you, as, as everyone could imagine, I'm sure they would be very happy to replace um, a tenant with liquidity issues with, with somebody that is liquid, that can pay that. And then maybe in the third instance, and again, you, of course, that um, that landlord will be part of the uh, of the universe of characters in the uh, in the liquidation proceedings, and then maybe the third level is, is involving the court in uh, in facilitating that. Yeah. Okay. So that I think that's really helpful. Okay. So as I say, we've still got the questions, and we're going to just finish up. Um, we're going to we're going to go through the questions next. But John, I just want to finish up, and I think we keep this you know reasonably brief. Um, I, I just wanted to touch on the um, the duties of, of a bankruptcy trustee. So, you know what you know what sort of duties does the bank, bankruptcy trustee have in general? And, and again, we can keep this quite high level um, and just you know touch on one or two of the provisions or one or two of the articles in the bankruptcy law which makes reference to those duties and you know how that might play out in a in the context of a sale you know what sort of duties would the, would the bankruptcy trustee have so we just just three or four minutes on that and then we'll turn to the questions absolutely um, the law of course provides for a wide range of officeholder duties and some of these are ministerial like publishing the claims or the voting deadlines some are analytical, such as expressing an opinion to the court as to whether a reorganization proposal carries a likelihood of approval. Some duties require the office holder to act as an advocate. For instance, if the office holder or trustee has to ask the court to remove management under Article 69. And uh, central to the reorganization process, under Article 70, as we've talked about, the debtor must obtain approval from the trustee to prepare a, a proposal to obtain funding, repay debts, or affect a sale. 
uh, Article 70 and 85, I think it is, 85, uh, say that the debtor has to obtain written permission from the office holder before transferring the ownership. Now, Article 70 also provides that the office holder shall exercise due care in carrying out its duties and powers. And in a liquidation, we have uh, Article 108, as Zaid mentioned earlier, contemplating that the trustee uh, may defer the sale if it's uh, for a reasonable period in the best interests of creditors. So we see a lot of these provisions saying that the office holder or trustee's duty primarily is to act in the best interests of creditors. It is a fiduciary role. The Code of Professional Conduct for Trustees, Article 3, requires professional competence and due diligence in performing acts. This means that the trustee needs to competently run the sale process to maximize the value of the assets for the benefit of the creditors. That same article requires a trustee to have objectivity, that is to be without a conflict of interest. So I think the takeaway here is that as long as you go into the engagement with the attitude that you are an honest broker, a facilitator of solutions who is objective and competent with an eye toward maximizing the value that we've been talking about for the last hour, then you'll be fine. Yeah, and I think that 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 is a that's our general experience too on a global basis. That um, you know, office holders or bankruptcy trustees, um, you know, the it, it's just as John said. I mean, it's not you know, no one's you know out there to to, to catch anyone out. Um, you know, they're, they're there to obviously perform a function, um, do it objectively, fairly, um, and um, you know, the, the, that's the takeaway as well that I would have. So I'm just going to um, run through the questions. Um, and I'm going to just choose people like Zaid or John or Simon to answer these questions. So it's a bit like mastermind. And, um, and the first question um, goes to Zaid. In liquidation, if the sale price at auction is lower than the evaluation, does the liquidator need to take any approvals? So we've got a we've got a um, we've got a sale at an auction. Um, the price comes in that. I mean, and and this actually we can we can circle back and talk in a little bit more because it ties in with another question. But you know, what would um, you've got any views on that? I've got one or two views. Maybe you go you go ahead, Mike, first, and then I'll uh, I'll chime in. Yeah. So this comes into another um, point, and it ties in with this question: In the event that the sale was made by public auction, the decision to sell must be made during the course of the auction. How can the requirement of approval by court or creditors committee be fulfilled? So what I would say in answer to both of these questions um, is that this would be you would pre-agree a process and this goes back to what John was talking about you would you set out the rules of engagement if you like um, and say you know this is the process we're going to run um, these are the these are the bidders this is you may put a floor on the um, price that the assets sell for or you may not um, it may be just so the idea would be that you'd set up the process so that you wouldn't have to go back and get further consent because it would all be set out in a um, in a procedure that's been pre-approved, so that I think that's what I would say. Yeah, uh, that, that's a. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Zay. No, uh, go just, go uh, ahead, John. I'll go after you. Oh, sorry. One one thing on on the point. I think this is a brilliant question about what do you do when you have to have communication with these creditors, and of all the many bad things that COVID has wrought upon the world, one positive outcome is just what we're doing today. We're, uh, we're together by Zoom and uh, we're communicating. And uh, so to the extent you have a situation that comes up in an auction that was not contemplated by the committee when it gave its pre-approval uh, or approved some parameters for the sale, uh, hopefully you anticipate those, but uh, having parties participate by Zoom in the auction um, to the extent there are manageable number may be of some help. Yeah, Zay, do you want to add anything yeah. to that? 
Yeah, no, that's really helpful. I mean, I was really just going to expand on the point that you made, Mike, which is, um, and, and maybe this is circular in the sense that you're saying, well, you, you preset the rules and hopefully those rules do allow you to, to deal with, with variations. But I, I think that's very sensible. And, and at least in the context of uh, legislation, specifically dealing with in, enforcement and um, um, in, enforcement via auctions, they're always, for example, there's a valuation, and if that valuation is not, uh, if the if the value of the asset is is not uh, attained during, let's say, a first auction, um, or at least a certain percentage, you can then take it to a second um, a second auction, and again with uh, continuing lowering thresholds until you basically say, well, then that, that's it, that's the process, and whatever the price is, it's gone. So you can build that that kind of a um, a system in, into the proceed into the process. Yeah um so what have we got here okay so one for simon who would bear the cost of the warranty and indemnity insurance if it was purchased um you free to negotiate between the seller and the buyer um typically it's really the entity that pushes for it um and uh if you are the seller pushing for it the buyer will turn around to you and say okay fine if you want it and you want to move the the uh, that risk over to another entity then you should bear it. Um, but in an auction process, interestingly enough, and one of the reasons why we constantly push clients uh, to look at auction processes, um, not just for timing, is that you can dictate that the buyer picks up the warranty and indemnity insurance. So you can package it up, have it ready, um, get, the, get the policy terms in place, present that to the, um, to the potential bidders um, and ask them in terms of the auction process that they bear the uh, the WNI insurance uh, costs, um, uh, which is uh, always beneficial for you. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Um, thanks, Simon. So, is stalking horse bid uh, stalking horse bids popular in most jurisdictions? Well, to be honest, I've never heard of a stalking horse till I started talking to uh, John Jordan. So, John, would you say that's a particular US thing? I mean, I think I in the I think in other contexts it's there, there may be um, similar types of things. But so, for example, in the UK, I don't know that I hear a lot about stalking horse, um, but I'd be interested. Yeah. Uh, Mike, uh, it's, it's an idiom, but the expression itself is probably some sort of uh, a metaphor that went back to the uh, 19th century frontiers and perhaps... But yeah. uh, to answer the question, it's a good question. Stalking horse, uh, that, that arrangement, whatever you call it, initial lead bidder arrangement, those are popular with debtors for sure. Because you don't, you're, you're always nervous going into an auction without having somebody who sets the floor. The, uh, the lead bidder for, or stalking horse bidder, however you call them, uh, sets a floor for everybody else. So going into the auction, it can only get better from there. It's a binding commitment as long as the court approves it. And that's part of what the lead bidder is signing up for. And that's part of why they want protections. Uh, going into, a, into an auction without having that means that you don't know what you're going to come out with. And we've had auctions that have resulted in very disappointing results. And a couple of the questions here today have focused on what happens if those results of the auction are disappointing. And sometimes you just end up with a, a very sad uh, result. So uh, that type of process is popular with debtors. But of course, the market is going to and your marketing efforts are going to affect whether you have one of those. Uh, but I think if you can get a lead bidder to set the floor, that's that's yeah. a good start. Yeah, no, it's a good good point um so simon this is probably another one for you and it overlaps a little bit with with the w and i and what we've been talking about um so from a legal point of view when you sell goods um in a liquidation it's usually without guarantee and they cannot be returned so this is this idea that you're selling them as is where is mm -hmm. um now the the including some warranties um in the agreement will of course you know, potentially raise the value of the product. I mean, if you're buying as is, where is, you're, you're either going to either say, well, that's fine, but I'm going to discount the price because there's a risks in here I can't quantify. Um, so in a, I guess in a, 
and, and maybe I can answer part of this and bring you in. But so, you know, in a, in a typical sales contract, what would you expect to see? I mean, from from our experience, it is um, it's it's as is, whereas I mean, as a as the liquidator who's you know effectively selling the asset, um, you know, you won't be in a position to give any sort of representations and warranties. You may be able to um, confirm title, and you may be able to. Um, you may be able to confirm no encumbrances, but you know you, you, you're not. You know, you're probably you, you're probably not going to go much further than that. And I think that's where you know having um, you know if we are talking about making life easier for the buyer, you know doing vendor due diligence. So the that means that as part of a, um, a process, the the seller, which in this case is the liquidator would engage the sort services of a law firm to prepare a due diligence report, which would effectively say that, you know, um, provide uh, the information on the asset that, you know, a buyer would typically expect to receive. And then, you know, if there are gaps, you know, looking at insurance. So I would say, you know, they would be the, the typical things that we would advise. But I think for most disposals in a, in a liquidation context, you're not going to get much out of the liquidator. That'd be your you Simon? Yeah I actually agree with you 100%. The, the way the best way to look at it um, is to understand what what these warranties are um, and I think from that you can probably understand why the liquidator is just not in a position to be able to give them. Warranties are statements of fact uh, relating to the company um, and its historical affairs. Um, so given that the liquidator hasn't operated it doesn't own it, um, it's difficult for it to give those statements of fact. Um, and certainly those statements of fact couldn't be given on a reliance basis to a buyer in any real um, material form that the, that the buyer could really take comfort on. Whatever the liquidator gives, it's probably a, a guessing game, given that it hasn't yeah. been around yeah. since inception. So Mike, you're absolutely right. I think in, that, in those scenarios, you'd get it very limited warranties and um, you, you would really want to look at the uh, W9 insurance or holdbacks or retentions or the like. Yeah. So we've got a really good question here, actually, which I like. Um, and it's, you know, how we've got here, um, how about assignment of construction or maintenance contracts? And it goes on to say, how can we determine the value of these contracts? If the liquidator discovered that the debtor assigned contracts with significant value for free or significantly below fair, its fair value, what should he do? Now, this this question is a, is a really interesting question. It's obviously um, slightly aside from, you know, sales processes, but we would say that, you know, obviously the, um, the you know, the, the aim of the law is to maximize the bankruptcy assets. And that would include, I would argue, um, determining whether, you know, any assets have been disposed of, um, you know, at an undervalue, um, or at a, you know, mainly at an undervalue, actually. And if they have, um, you know, what should we, what should be done to recover those assets? So and that, to answer this question, um, you know, how do you place a value on a, on a contract or a maintenance contract or a construction contract? Well, you would need to get it, you would need to have, you know, a specialist do that. Um, now, it may be that the bankruptcy trustee has that specialization, but I suspect there's going to be um, you know, plenty of valuers out there who would be able to put a value on that contract. Um, and if that contract has been disposed of at less than, than the value that's been assigned to it, then you, you've got to make the decision, well, you know, what do we do about that? Um, now, there are provisions in the law to enable transactions to be unwound. Um, and in particular in relation to related party transactions, slightly more difficult if the contract was sold, you know, for value for good faith. But I think, you know, anyone who, who was buying an asset realizing they weren't paying very much for it and that the business was in a distressed situation wouldn't be um, a good faith buyer. So, and then you've got the question, okay, I'm the liquidator, I want to recover those assets, but you know, how do I go about doing that? Because it's going to cost money. And I think either, um, you know, assets need to be disposed of to, to um, raise money to pay for any claim to, to get those assets back. Or alternatively, you know, the creditors may decide, well, 
there's been such a significant number of assets transferred out at an undervalue, we want to fund the litigation to recover it. And we, we, we we're involved in, in several of those um, um, at, at, at the moment. Um, and we know of two or three in Saudi where this, this exact issue has arisen. Um, in fact, the contracts were assigned to a related party and the, um, the liquidator is in the process of looking to recover. So that's how we would deal with that one. And that, um, that, uh, that may flip us into chapter 13 as well, which of course that litigation um, could involve, uh, you know, uh, articles 200, 201, 202, those, uh, those which carry heavy penalties for intentionally giving away or deflating the value of an asset uh, prior to or after the commencement of a bankruptcy procedure. Yeah, and I think this is an interesting one um, because I think in, in you know, or the, the these provisions have been able to unwind transactions. You know, they they're a common feature in um, uh, most uh, bankruptcy laws. Um, are they used much? Mm, not much, but they they are used. And um, you know, I think it's something that the um, liquidators will need to look at um, with all of these um, liquidations. You know, whether you know there are any any um, assets that have been trans out, transferred out at an undervalue and how they go about recovering those. So I think it's an important one. Uh, next question, in, real in, the, in a real estate auction, is it advisable to publish the valuation report before the auction to encourage bidders? Well, it depends what the valuation report says. If it's a good one, um, we would suggest yes. I mean, of course, you're going to need the, um, you're going to need the consent of the valuer to be able to do that, but typically, with, a, with an auction, you would have a data room which um, potential bidders can visit. Um, and in that data room, you know, typically we would, we would expect that there, there to be a valuation. Now, um, obviously that's been obtained by the um, seller, um, but the, it, it may be possible for a bidder to get reliance on that valuation or probably more commonly, um, they can use that as a benchmark, but they're probably going to get their own uh, valuation team to look at look at it as well, but you know the more information you can provide on the asset, the better. I, I it would be my view. Um, next question. Um, okay, so let me just read the question, and then I might need to revisit one or two aspects of it. So. Um, as a liquidator for one of the properties, a limited auction has been set up to which those interested in this property have been invited. So the tenants offered 30 million for this property and another person offered 30 million, 200,000. And he would leave these tenants even if he had to, he, he would leave these tenants even if he had to resort to court. And I think that means um, he would want them to leave. Which is the right choice for awarding the auction to it? The first option, money will be fast and the tenants will be the new owners. So there, there's a situation, let me just sum that up. We've got two competing bids. Um, the tenant ha wishes to buy the property for 30 million um, and the, um, a third party wishes to buy it for 30 million, 200,000, but they're going to terminate the lease. Which one should we, which, um, who should we be selling to as a, as a liquidator? I think just so we're, um, and this this isn't, doesn't answer the question, but it's not uncommon in a lease um, for just because a landlord changes doesn't necessarily mean the lease terminates. Although um, it probably would be common if your landlord um, becomes bankrupt the tenant may have the option to terminate, but it, it's going to it's going to turn on the um, what the terms of the lease say. So, even if someone a new owner came in and bought the property, typically the um, the lease wouldn't terminate because, as is in common with leased property, um, you know buildings are changing hands all the time. But that doesn't answer your question. In this case, where um, the tenant could buy and stay in stay in the property, or a third party could come in and terminate the lease. But you're getting two hundred thousand dollars more. I mean, I suspect you'd have to go for the thirty million two hundred thousand, wouldn't you? 
Yeah, I think I mean, Mike. That's uh, as as you say. There's a there's a balancing act going going on here, and maybe that takes us back to that Article 30 of Chapter Eight, where it's the duty or or the the liquidator is looking to get the best possible price, taking into consideration the various uh, various factors. And, and one of them, of course, is, is timing on, on when payment will take place. So it, it's not entirely clear to me from this fact pattern. I mean, as you say, 30.2 is, is the highest, um, but it's not entirely clear to me how that interacts with the delay in payment because of the potential. Exactly. And I think this was alluded to in the question, actually. So yeah. <clears throat> Does that mean that we would, that the seller would have to terminate the lease? So effectively, what the new buyer is saying, I want it vacant. Um, and if that was the yeah. case, then you would have to say that the thirty million you'd be selling yeah. to the tenant. Exactly. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Clo closing risks and timing are always something that uh, get taken into account, and the it may make sense in that instance for the trustee, the creditors, uh, the debtor to go back. Uh, think about how long they can hold out and how much those risks are. Over here, sometimes we have regulatory risks that uh, say a governmental entity will not approve the transaction uh, that, that sometimes knock good offers out of the, uh, out of the running. Yeah. Okay. So that's great. Um, one last question I think we'll, we'll do. It's just coming up to 630. Um, so if one of the bankruptcy assets exceeded the value of the total debt um, or it covers the debt amount, does the trustee need to proceed further with the liquidation process of the other assets? Well, I think the answer to that is no. Um, and so in, 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 in that sort of scenario, um, the, the job of the liquidator is to you know, sell the assets, pay off the creditors um, and any excess would be returned to the debtor. So and obviously if you've sold an asset, it pays off all the creditors and there, there are other assets left. Well, then they, 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 they remain the property of the debtor, I think. And as a liquidator, you can give yourself a medal. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're a hero. Exactly. So Abdullah, I think we, we're at 6.30. People have done very well actually to remain online. We appreciate that. Um, and we really appreciate the questions because um, I think that's where we all, learn the most, including ourselves. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, actually, uh, uh, we've had uh, such a good time. Uh, really uh, very important uh, comments and uh, recommendations. Thank you so much for that. I have uh, one last question uh, from one of uh, my colleagues. What are the best practices of evaluating trademarks? Uh, you know, sometimes there are no financial statements or they, they are very old. Is there best practice for, for, uh, for uh, evaluating the trademarks and uh, selling them? Probably one for John. Have you got any views on that? I've probably got it, one or two. It, but... it, it, cer it certainly depends on the jurisdiction. Uh, assignment of trademarks uh, in, in, for instance, U.S. bankruptcy law, we've got a huge section of our bankruptcy code devoted to intellectual property and trademarks. Uh, some can be assigned, some cannot. In terms of value, uh, evaluating them, there are two ways to look at it. One is as part of the uh, business in general, a brand, a, a uh, trademark may carry a lot of value uh, only in the context of the business. Sometimes it can be valued independently. Oftentimes we see trademarks sold in, uh, in pure liquidations of, of piecemeal assets. A uh, good example was uh, Remington uh, Firearms Manufacturer. It sold off its gun business it, with the trademark, but that was a very small portion of its business. It sold off other lines of business like ammunition and and other things, uh, but the trademark did have some independent value. Uh, it had to be evaluated in advance, uh, but ultimately the market decides. Yeah, and I think it's interesting because there have been, particularly with COVID, there have been some businesses that have been disappearing altogether, although the you know they've got a great brand or a great trademark and one of the ones that um, you, some of you may have heard of it, but it's it's the shirt maker called Pink, P-I-N-K. 
and I was um, reading about them um, you know, a couple of months ago, and that business has actually gone insolvent, and the only asset that was sold was the trademark. Um, so there will be um, you know some value attributed to these sorts of assets, but it, again, you know, I don't know that it's a it's it's more of an art than a science. I don't know. There's a black and white answer to your question, Abdullah. You would. It's, it's all to do between you know what someone would, would be prepared to pay for that. And in the context of the one I just gave that pink shirt maker, they had a very, very good brand and someone was prepared to pay a substantial amount of money just for the brand. So. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Michael, Mr. Zaid, Mr. Simon, Mr. Jonathan. Uh, on behalf of the Bankruptcy Committee, thank you so much for uh, taking this time to speak to us today. We really appreciate that. Uh, and we uh, wish to, to uh, host another uh, workshop or something like that uh, in the near future, inshallah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, great. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you being here. Uh, thank you again for joining us uh, today in this workshop. And we'll see you soon. Uh, thank you so much and uh, have a good night. Thanks, Abdullah. Thanks for the invite. Really appreciate it. Good luck. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.